What's up, Brad? How you doing, buddy? Hey, Megan. How are you? Give people a few minutes. You guys hear me okay? Hopefully. Hey, Anna. How are you? Hey, Aaron. There's my friend. Hope you had a good trip back wherever you went. Hey, Ara. Hey, Carol. Hey, Clayton. How you doing, buddy? Out there killing it with your dog. Glad to see you, folks. What's today? Two? Yeah, Tuesday. I always lose track when I travel what day it is. Mm -hmm. Hey, Matthew. How you doing, buddy? Well, now that my wife is helping me, and she's home. Maybe I can get back out there, Matthew. Things are a little little better now with her being here. You know? Uh, no, I don't think that's the case, buddy. I think someone put in the work and I think it's just going to keep getting better and better. Yeah, yeah, I just, I'm not a, I enjoy the time I have there, but the, the traveling, it, it's getting harder for sure, especially, I guess, since I drive and it was like an 11 hour drive. It just kicks my ass now. All right, Justin, I'm drinking this one here, this Bull Run 16 year that my buddy Rob gave me. It's 122 proof, aged in a, Pinot Noir, which is different, and it's outstanding. I got another bottle that my buddy John gave me that I got to tap into also here tonight, maybe, you know. Uh, whenever you want, Clayton. I haven't done one with someone on here in a while. I kind of miss that, you know. I definitely miss that. <clears throat> hey, Steph, can you bring me that other bottle that's up there too, please? Hey, Monique, how are you? Just put it there. Thank you. Everything good? Yeah, I, I have an, uh, a smoked bourbon. I don't think so, Sharon. I, I, I may have, but I don't think so. Now, I love, I love a deep, smoky scotch. I love a good, peated, smoky, smoky scotch for sure. What's up, Kashi? How you doing, buddy? <clears throat> Yeah, that's really good. If you like bourbon, I, I forget. My buddy Rob got this someplace. They distill it out there someplace. Missouri, maybe, if he said. I think that's what he said. Man, it's good. It is really different. Uh, I don't know. Okay. We got over 100 people on here. We'll get started. What's up, Dylan? How you doing, pal? Hey, Matt. It was great seeing you again, bub. Oh, oh, shit. Damn it. Steph, can you get me a paper towel? I forgot I had coasters on there that my friend Jessica made me. You see? Damn it. I forgot the coaster was there and I did a little spillage. Wasted a little bourbon. Mm -hmm. Had a coaster accident because I never use coasters. Hey, Yuki. How are you, Yuki? Road Dogs Rehab. Yeah, good. No, I just started. And I haven't had any bourbon in, in a while, man. I think uh, 
last time I had a drink was in St. Louis about a month ago at the seminar. I just, there's times I just don't feel like tired and stuff. Hey, John, going to bust into your bottle here too. Here you go, John. Right. That one too. Um, all right. So let's, let's tap right into it. You know, when I said I was going to do this live, it's because I just came out of the gym. So the endorphins were flowing and everything was fresh and I had all these ideas. Now it's several hours later and I'm like, the hell was I going to talk about, you know, but here's why I wanted to talk, uh, why, why I wanted to jump on. Um, I've done a lot of seminars over the past few years, right? I do the ones with Jay and Joel, which are awesome. And I do a bunch by myself. <clears throat> and I always meet a lot of really awesome people, like just very, very lucky. You know, I always, always, and I never will stop till the day I die, go back to the first three seminars I did ever several years ago. Nashville, Tennessee was the first. Poughkeepsie, New York was the second. And West Virginia was the third. And they were terrible for so many reasons. Biggest reason was back then, everybody just wanted e-collar stuff. It was like, you know, like there's some kind of secret sauce or something. And it was freaking awful. It was terrible. You don't know how to do seminars and everything is new. So it was good, right? So over the years, we keep trying to make things better and better. And, you know, we kind of just try to cater to, hey, Kate, how are you? We're going to, we've got to talk tomorrow, Kate, so we can meet up soon. So you can cater to what everybody needs, right? And try to do the best you can and make it fun for people and have a good time. Um, when I went to Arkansas last year, you know, first day was great and everything, but I ended on a like sour note. And that's when I had decided I'm done doing solo seminars. It's just too much. I was in a bad mood. I was exhausted, you know, and mm -hmm. I kind of ended it in a way I didn't, I didn't like to. Um, but I got to tell you, <clears throat> first Rob and, and, and Joint Forces Canine Group, he runs a, a phenomenal place, like is professional of a place. It's run so professionally more than any place you'll ever see, really. His young staff is always fantastic. So I really enjoy being out there, you know. Hey, Mandy, how you doing? I wanted to jump in. Again, the reason I like to talk about things, these seminars, hey, Rosa, are a tremendous education for me because you get to see where people really struggle, where dog owners struggle, where dog trainers struggle. You see it over and over and over. And it's important that you share that stuff, right? I think it's important anyway to try to help people avoid the same problems, you know? And just over the past year, just last year alone, I was in front of just under a thousand people. That's a lot of people, man. That's a lot of people. You see a lot of dogs, you see a lot of situations, but there's very rarely anything new that pops up where people are struggling. Very rarely. It happens, but most of the time it's the same stuff, right? So first of all, I wanted to talk about how so many people, and this is the majority of people, get focused on tools and techniques and methods or the latest fad, and they completely disregard the emotions of the animal, but not only of the animal, but of themselves too, right? You tend to focus on the dog and the problems. And most people, we get a lot of non-dog professionals, right? Like a lot of people come to a seminar for the first time because they want their problems fixed, understandable. And um, everybody wants to focus on the problem, okay? This seminar, we had a lot of people there. We had a lot of dogs. And what makes a good seminar, in my opinion, first of all, is the people, the personalities, the willingness to participate and ask questions and, and, and do whatever it takes, and the dogs. If we have a bunch of dogs that just, you, you don't see a lot of real problems, or you don't have a lot of great dogs where people want to do cool things, that could be a pain in the butt, right? The nice thing about this uh, 
Yeah, it was, it was good, Mandy. Like I really enjoyed this. It was just fantastic. I was a little overwhelmed by how many people Saturday was a 14 hour day and I'm still hurting from it. I truly am still hurting from it. But the beautiful thing about this was we had a lot of dogs that really struggled, really struggled around dogs. And in turn, a lot of owners that really struggled because of it, and they've never been able to find relief. Many of them have been through other trainers. They've been through a bunch of trainers. They've been to other seminars. And again, what does it always come down to, guys? Porn training. Louder, harder, louder, harder, louder, harder, right? Excessive negative reinforcement, thinking they're trying to punish a behavior. And we all know what happens with that. We all know what happens. It's short-lived, okay? So, you know, we got to see, we had a bunch of shepherds there too, four or five shepherds, if not more, and they all struggled around dogs, right? Really had a hard time, the majority of them. The majority of the dogs at the seminar that struggled around dogs at one time, at least one time in their life, had been attacked by other dogs in one way or the other. Some of them multiple times in different scenarios. So it's really important for non-dog people that we really start to educate and start teaching people, your dog does not need to meet other dogs, especially on leash, especially at a dog park. Does not need to go find dog friends, especially on leash, especially at a dog park, right? It happens over and over and over. Now, with that being said, a lot of these dogs were completely full of shit. They just were. They seemed like terrorists and they would really put on a big act. But the second I would grab them and have a conversation, like literally have a conversation, you know, the dogs are like, oh, my God, please don't tell no one. It was it was great to see, you know, it was really it was really great to see. But what happens and we talk about this constantly, but we'll dive deeper into things. What happens when an everyday dog owner has a German Shepherd or any dog, and every time he sees a dog, it blows up and goes crazy. What happens? Mom or dad removes them from the situation, right? They reward them for that situation. Or the person or dog coming towards them turns around, goes the other way or crosses the road, again, rewarding them for the situation. And they never have to learn how to deal with that stress because they learn what tool works very quickly. Well, we don't do that at these seminars, right? So a lot of people still don't understand why I allow all the dogs to be in the room from day one. I don't understand why people don't do that, okay? But that's just me. So if you have a working spot at a seminar, most seminars, your dog's not going to get worked a lot. Maybe one time, maybe two times. It's not a ton of work. Non-dog people don't understand that. Working dog people understand that, right? But what I tell people is if you just bring your dog there, especially if it struggles in situations and you never bring your dog out to work it, tremendous things are going to happen. For one, make no mistake about it. A seminar is a very unfair and unrealistic place to train dogs, especially a dog that struggles with problems. It's not fair to the dog or the owner. It's unrealistic unrealistic but all the work we do whether it's a two-day a three-day a four-day a five-day it doesn't matter the most important thing is that we start providing the information for the owner i say it all weekend long we are putting these dogs in situations it's not fair you being here like this but that's why you're here we're going to give you the tools to make things better and i tell everybody the same thing the way you're going to see me do things, it's just the way I do things. It doesn't mean it's the only way. It might not even be the best way in many eyes, right? It's the way I do things. And also, the most important thing for me is that I could provide at least one, at least one thing, something of true value that isn't just entertainment for the people being there, but that when they leave, they could actually implement it and start bettering their situations. That's really important to me, right? 
So you guys that were there, you saw some some people really struggle, right? You saw them really struggle. But by the end, what's the final thing we did? We went outside. We had a long row of people and dogs, really long. Couldn't yell from one end to the other. And we talked every dog that was there, lined them up, close proximity, and everybody had to work and figure eight and loop through all those dogs. Not one single dog struggled with that. Not one single dog blew up. Not a one. Not a one. Why? Well, are they fixed? Absolutely not. Not even close. Not even close. But for one, the owners got to see what the dog is capable of. I make sure of that, right? I'll I'll handle the dogs as much as I have to, but the majority of the time, I'm going to be helping the owners handle that dog. I'm going to handle them when I have to to help show them, look, look how quick your dog could change. And we showed that all weekend long, right? One of my favorite parts of the seminar is with Aaron's dog, Cairo, the Malinois that you guys see with the muzzle on. A dog struggled, blew up multiple times, right? Over and over and over. Big blow ups. Erin struggled. She's an amazing sport. I kicked her ass so many times the first day. I really beat her up. I, I really stuck it to her and, and, and made her get out there and work in front of everyone. And it was hard at first. She's going to fail over and over. She's supposed to but I can't have her scared to make the mistake and I can't have the dog scared to make a mistake. Right. And we're not going to try to beat that out of the dog. That dog is scared to death, scared to death. Right. But that first day when Aaron started clicking and making things right, it shows how valuable that stress is for both human and dog. You learn to deal with that stress and get through it and you find what works. Okay. One of my favorite moments of that seminar is when Cairo blew up at um, at Rose's dog, I think it was, right? Brocky, the border collie, I think, I think it was it was that dog. And and I literally said, Oh, oh, this you want this? Okay, here, come on. And I took Cairo from Aaron and I said, Come on, let's go get that border collie. And when I took Cairo away from Aaron to go to the border collie that she uh, appeared to want to attack, what did she do? She turned around and it was Scooby-Doo as fast and hard as she could go to get away from the dog and back to mama. It was comical, right? We had a good time with it because it's important that people see you. You don't have a bad dog. You don't have a bad dog. This is not a killer, not even close. You have a dog that's scared of everything. And this is how they learn to feel better. What's up, Jay? Miss you, buddy. Can't wait to June. Really important. Aaron struggled so much through all weekend. I don't want her leaving like that. So what's the last thing we did? Aaron, get the muzzle off the dog, bring this dog out. And I just want you to play with her and have a good time. Will she play with you here? I think she said, I think so. Let's, let's make that happen. Because I don't want the last picture for that dog and Aaron to, I don't want them to leave with the last picture being something. So that dog's still struggling. I don't want that. Right. But before we had her do that, what did the punishment become for that dog? Kicking the dog's ass? No. E-collars? No, there's no e-collar. We're not using e-collars to, to fix, correct any of this stuff. Never. We just don't do it. What, did, what was going to happen? What did I say? She blew up. I took the dog. I told her, leave. Leave the building. Go outside for a while. That became the punishment. Right. You just lost your mama now because you're acting like this. And I took that dog out into the middle with me and we brought out all the dogs and had everybody work their dogs. Did she go after any dogs? No. You know why? I put her in that situation and the only thing she cared about is where's my mama. She stared at that door. That was it. That was it. She didn't want to fight those dogs. She was already in the mix, but I'm going to teach her to cope with that stress and show her you're not going to die, right? So the final thing we did is when Aaron came out, play with your dog, have a good time. And it was beautiful to watch. No muzzle. The stress went away. 
and she just had a fantastic time. What happened when the dog wouldn't out the tug? Do we really care about that at that point? No. Did we get her out? Yeah, but that wasn't what's important. What's important is when Cairo didn't want to out for Erin, what did her eyes look like? Was she defiant and vicious and mean? No. She turned into soft eyes like, come on, I don't want to give this to you. Don't play. All these things are so important for people to see. So we ended that on a beautiful note. And Erin's absolutely amazing, right? I posted a picture tonight. There was an absolutely awesome couple there. Again, a beautiful female working line German Shepherd had a bunch of blowups. Tori, her name was Tori. As soon as I started speaking right in the beginning and Tori blew up, you know, so I couldn't hear my, I just went and got her. Come here. Come here. She was full of crap. Another one, right? What did that dog do when I took her? She apologized and sucked up to me left to right. She's a sweet dog, man. Super sweet dog. But are they going to fix it just by trying to punish it out of her? No. Why? Because most people don't understand punishment, first of all. And most equate punishment to force and being hard on the dog. I said it a thousand times over the weekend. Punishment isn't about force. As a matter of fact, I need you to take it down right? We don't need you going hard on these dogs. It's, it's never worked before. It's not going to work now. We're going to show the dog different pictures, a very different picture of things they've never seen before. Something that doesn't allow them to manipulate how you stop and get out of things. And we see how effective it is over and over and over again, right? But we got to see all kinds of different things, all kinds of different things. When um, Rosa was talking about her border collie, Brocky, he struggles with stranger danger. She struggles with stranger danger, right? So someone like me that looks like me, an extremely handsome, large gentleman, you know, with a beard and a hat, she freaks out. So what did we do? You're not going to punish that out of a dog, but you're also not going to reward it out of a dog. That could rewards and food and toys. That could all be part of the equation, but there has to be more, right? Why is someone laughing at that statement? Okay. But what did, what do we do? I showed her what, like four different things we did, right? Four different things. Okay. But what I wanted people to see is when I approached with different, just facial expressions, the look on Brocky's face, we watched her eyes go from soft to as I approach to get big and whale eyed with me, a soft face, making nice eye contact. I was smiling. So when I said, watch this, I changed my expression. My eyes got harder. My face got angry. What did she do? Her eyes almost popped out of her head. What did she do when I changed my facial expression? She went back to softer. We were able to show how important your body language is because when you get some dumbass approaching your dogs, how the dog feels. And if I remember correctly, that's what Rosa said. Some asshole insisted on putting pressure on her and coming up, even when Rosa said, you know, get the fuck out of here or whatever she had to tell him, right? That was powerful. So what did we do? We had Rosa start stepping in front and dealing with me, sending me away, right? That took minutes before Brocky was able to really relax and just when I started approaching, she started looking for mom and she took care of it, right? Took care of it. Other times I'd be approaching and waiting for the stress to be where I thought we were at our max. And when the dog gave me some kind of calming sign and, and looked away, I would exit. Showed her four different things. We ended it by, you know, at the end, I would walk past the room. I toss food to her, never approaching the dog, but I would never want her attention either. I just kept moving away. What happened that night when we came back from night training? Immediately. We're standing around talking. I'm talking to Rose and the dog jumps up, giving me a hug up on my chest. I didn't ask for that. But even when she did that, I didn't put myself on her and give her that attention, right? That's that dog telling me, hey, that one thing. The other thing we made sure that dog saw me and Rosa talking and her being comfortable with me and shaking my hand and just a positive interaction between me and mom. We showed all these different pictures so the dog could start putting two to two together. So, oh, okay, I don't have to worry about that. It's really important right? Really important. The most difficult dog in the group. Let me take a little. Oh, shit. Again, I forgot the coaster. Um, 
the most difficult dog in the group? Luca, the pit bull. Now, I won't go into too many details because I, I would want to talk to Josh first before I go into any personal details. But uh, I didn't spill anything, babe. I just got the look and she gave me a rag. Um, young couple coming in with this pit bull, Luca, really struggled, right? Really struggled. Scream. You know the pit bull scream, right? As soon as he sees a dog, they're screaming. They're screaming. The thing is, Luca's owner has been through um, hell and back physically. And I won't go into details because I'd have to talk to him first, but really life altering medical issues. The fact that he would have the balls to walk in with that dog blows my mind. Those two, and especially Josh, is a badass, like a superhero. Mind-blowing. Mind-blowing. So you'd have to be there to understand this and watch this man, right? So when we were working that dog, and I say, okay, you guys are kind of avoiding each other, and you're kind of moving to the side when the other dog's approaching. He says, no, I, I kind of you know, have trouble going straight, and there's a weakness there, and there's a balance there, and there's a lot of physical issues with a really tough dog. Why is that dog like that? Is it a bad dog? No. That dog was attacked brutally as a puppy. That dog was attacked again at eight months old. What's that dog learned to do to keep itself safe? I'll kill you first. That was a serious dog. No joke. Are we going to, so a few of you pointed out, you said he was kind of hard on that dog in the video. First of all, it was day one. We weren't training yet. I just saw that dog running, so I wanted to film it. So I didn't even know that was really going on. But people don't know what to do, right? And if it looked like he was going hard, no, he wasn't, right? Because he has different physical things going on where he's not going to be able to hammer the dog like that. That dog screamed through everything with, with no corrections or anything right day two now what would happen again when luca would go over the top people are going to panic and struggle that's normal even if you tell people what to do it's not enough guys and you guys know i'm big on this like people struggle with their clients they don't even if you tell them even if you show them doesn't mean they know how to do it you have to help them you have to show them you have to teach them you have to motivate them same thing with the dog and they can't be scared to make mistakes. And they have to make enough mistakes so you can guide them through it and then they'll know it. So at times when Luca would have bad blowups and I would take her and bring her through the dogs and stuff, did I ever hammer her? No, it was more of a conversation. We would stop and I would make her, I would never remove her when she started blowing up. I would stop and I would have a conversation with the dog. It's not gonna happen. You can't do this mama. But until you chill out, we're going to be right here talking about this, right? Day two, she was amazing. Amazing. Now, at the end, when we lined up all those people outside, now, mind you, this is outside on grass. It's uneven. There's clumps of grass here, clumps of, you know, what it's like being outdoors. When I had everybody walking and weaving through those dogs, I didn't want Josh to do that because I didn't want to risk him like tripping or stepping in a hole and falling down with Luca. And I was going to tell him, hey, buddy, you don't have to do this. But just in the two days I was with him, I don't think that was going to fly. He's a bad dude, man. He's a really bad dude, like a, a, a true inspiration. He did it just like everybody else. He walked and weaved through every freaking dog as far as you could see through that whole line. Luca never cared. Never cared, never blew up, wasn't stressed. Luca also sat there as every dog went around her and past her and behind her, never cared. That guy did that. Do you understand what kind of courage that takes? Every single person that shows up with a difficult dog has big balls. To get out there and fail and struggle with a difficult dog, that's something that I will never, ever take for granted takes a lot for people to do that right this guy is different level different level they succeeded big time is she fixed 
Lord, no, you don't fix a dog like that at a seminar. But we give him as much knowledge and information as we can, just like all these people. Now, when they go home, now we could put the dog in a situation that's fair to them. We go back without all the insane distractions and stressors. And we start taking the information these people have learned. And I'm going to continue to help them so they don't forget, right? And they conquer that with nothing around. And then we move outside to maybe a little bit more. And you keep building on that, right? But again, what does everyone have in common? Nobody has a solid foundation of the basics. Nobody. Is the communication clear and consistent? No. Are the words you use clear and consistent and have true meaning to the dog? No. And these are things that I can't overemphasize. They have to be conquered and accomplished, right? Now, the beautiful thing is play is becoming so much more popular and people are starting to try to do that with their dogs. It's not easy for everyone. And what hurts people is their insincerity when they're interacting with their dogs. And it's not with bad intentions, right? They want to do the right thing. But when people come out and try to put on an act, hey, Jen, when they try to put on an act and get all silly and bouncing around and running around and being the boogie oogie woogie man to try to get the dog to interact with them, and then you wonder why the dog has no interest. It doesn't make sense. It's not appealing to the dog. It's so insincere, right? So you saw some of those same dogs. I would say, give me the dog. And I'd sit on the ground. I would just sit down and barely do anything. I'd play a little coy and smack them in their ass a little and maybe just give them a little push away from me. And what did everyone do? Oh, you son of a bitch. You, you're not going to push me away. I'll jump right on you. Next thing you know, we're wrestling, right? We're wrestling. Poking him in the belly, I'm hiding. Oh, you son of a bitch, right? Poking him by the butt, hiding. Because I'm sincerely enjoying myself with the dog. I want the interaction. Well, on a flip note, when my friend Mandy came out with her Visla puppy, and Mandy's been there every year. This is four years in a row, right? She came out with her Visla puppy. I sat there and I enjoyed. I just loved it. I watched it because she killed it. She killed it. Why was that dog bouncing around so insane? Why was it bouncing around so insane? Because Mandy was so sincere, right? She was so sincere in her interaction. She's not lying to the dog. And the dog knows that, felt that. And watching them interact together was beautiful, which, by the way, we introduced the dog to the e-collar before that, which we normally don't do. But Mandy wanted to get that done there the right way. We spent 10 minutes doing that. The dog did beautiful as it's supposed to, and it should for no reason. And then we went right in. We're done with the training. Now let's have a good time with this dog. And she did. She's amazing. She's freaking amazing. She didn't look like that the first time I met her with her dog, right? Or even the second time. But this is someone that is so committed to her dogs that she can't fail, right? In the middle of it, I told people, I said, do you see how that dog is responding to her? I said, it's because she's sincere in her love for this animal. <laughs> Just in the middle of playing, she goes, I love this dog. I said, I know you do, it shows. You know, I love you too, Mandy. Amazing human being, right? That's what we want for these dogs. Now, the people who don't accomplish that, it's not because they don't want to. They don't know how to. It doesn't come natural. And that's okay. We work on it. We work on it. Right? But here's the other thing, guys. This is important, too, for trainers out there that maybe do seminars that are going to do seminars. One of the things I told myself this year, I, 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 I tried to do this with all seminars, but especially, <laughs> but especially after I ended last year, just, it, it, you know, I didn't like the way it ended. So the morning, the night before the seminar, the morning before the drive there out to Rob's beautiful place, 
I'm not focusing on, you know, what I'm going to do, what are we going to work on? What am I going to introduce? What am I going to talk about? What if, you know, this dog, that I'm not thinking of any of that stuff. I tell myself a few things. For one, I have to be myself. I can't try to be anything else. I just have to be myself. And I have to enjoy this and appreciate this moment because people come from really far away and sacrifice their time and money to be with this big gorilla. So I have to remind myself that on the way there. It's my job to be happy and kind and polite and appreciate that moment because that moment might not be there forever, right? Next year, maybe nobody ever wants to see me again and my time is up because that happens to everyone. Maybe I'm no longer, um, you know, provide value. So I have to keep in mind, be myself, have a good time. Have a good time with this. Treat people better than they deserve, no matter what. And don't let one person influence the way I treat others. Like these are the things I'm telling myself on the way there. I had no idea that was a first airplane experience, Rosary, that you even came on a plane with her. That's awesome. You know, that's awesome. But those things are important because it starts with me. And if I come in with a holier than now shitty attitude or like this God complex or, you know, you're here to learn from me. No, 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 no. I'm your employee. I work for you. I work for you. And I have to do all I can to give you what you're paying me for. Right. It's really important. So I think that kind of sets the tone and this group of people was absolutely incredible. We had such a good time. We laughed all day long. Then of course there's some crying, there's some tears because that happens every time too. Why? Again, we start touching on really deep stuff um, about personal things. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Rob. Um, personal things that people struggle with and go through. And when I start talking about how important it is to understand that there's people that have been through things in their past, there's people that are going through things right now. There's people that are struggling. No one has a perfect life. And a lot of that influences what we do and how we treat our animals. And then I give very specific examples and very rarely can I make it through, especially one or two of those examples without really having a hard time and breaking down. And that's when usually most people are breaking down. But that stuff's really, really important. It's really important, guys, because if you're a dog trainer, especially a young dog trainer, and you don't understand that this individual has been through hell and back and went through the worst things possible that any, let's say, parent could ever go through. And then you're pissed at this individual because she can't use any kind of rules or boundaries or, or, or anything, can't even tell her dogs no, right? If you don't understand there's a reason why she can't tell her dogs no, you're going to fail. You're going to struggle and you're going to be one of those trainers that blame the client that doesn't like to do their homework because they're lazy. Right. Mm hmm. Ah, thanks, Je Jessica. You're awesome. And your card was amazing. And I don't know if you saw it, Jessica, but I've spilt my drink a few times because I keep forgetting I have a coaster now. It's important. These are things I don't think a lot of people talk about. Right. It's important. If you want to be a better freaking dog trainer, you have to read the individual. If I'm saying bad words and I see someone that's uncomfortable with that in the audience, I can't say, if you don't like it, leave. You know what I mean? This is how I talk. I got to take that into consideration. Let me change the way I'm delivering things, right? That person's paying to be here, maybe thinks I'm a decent human being. Let's not let them down, right? Let's change things up. I'll say poop instead of shit. I'll say mother trucker instead of motherfucker, right? I don't have a problem with that. That's going to make someone feel a little better. No problem. You understand what I'm saying? So as always, like this seminar, what, yeah, I, I don't say any bad words in front of Rob's mom. I love Rob's mom and dad. 
And I don't care if I'm in the middle of talking. If they walk in, I'm going over to give her a big hug. Cool. All right. And and thanks to Rob, she calls me the John Travolta of dog training. And I will never forget that. But I'm always going to go give her a hug. I don't care what we're, we're in the middle of, but I don't say any bad words in front of her. So I'm always looking. Right. And I don't I don't curse a lot, but sometimes I feel like uh, it, it's important to stress a situation for one reason or the other, but it's, it's, it's not necessary. You understand what I'm saying? I'm trying to think, um, just really cool dogs. You know, Jessica's dog is absolutely friggin' amazing. Like I didn't want to let that dog go. Right. I mean, we had really cool people there, really cool dogs, but it's nice when you see dogs struggling. Okay. Even like, um, with Dylan's dog, Dylan's a great dude, man. What a great young guy. He's definitely going to go places in this world. We thought we were going to work on one thing coming out, right? But when I see that he's trying to do a little heads up healing, and if that's what you want, if you want competition style healing, okay, we're going to stop and we're going to go way backwards because we skipped, you skipped many, many steps. And if you really want to do this right, Let's start from scratch, right? And it looks real easy when you watch a lot of people do it, right? Real easy to, to lure and mark things and put dogs in position. It looks that way, but it's not easy for everyone, right? What if your dog doesn't really follow the hand, doesn't know how to follow the hand, right? All these little things that we had the opportunity to go over, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was really, really cool really cool but i am very grateful for the the turnout and the interaction with the people man it was like it was second to none it really was and saturday i was hoping maybe nobody wanted to train because my body was hurting my feet were swollen my legs were swollen and man that place was packed saturday night so that was a 14-hour day thanks to rosa and dylan and jessica who brought me food, made some Colombian food and delivered it to me. That's good stuff, man. Like, like it's a, it's an amazing thing. And what I love about these seminars is the friendships that people make by coming to these things and they continue to come back over and over and they stay tight and they have friendships outside of the seminars. I love that. Like that's, that's absolutely amazing. You know, absolutely amazing. But again, what we see over and over, try this tool. Your dog wants to attack dogs or people, put this tool on them, do this. That's never, ever, ever, ever going to work. It may give you temporary relief for one reason or the other, but you're not changing anything upstairs in the dog. Right. And to this day, everyone at that seminar is witness to this day. Right. Absolutely. Miss White. Yep. Laverne and Shirley. To this day, the confusion and the misunderstanding between negative reinforcement and punishment. You guys have seen it's massive. It's massive. And that's why we focus so hard on that, because if you understand that, then stopping behaviors is very, very simple. But the other thing that I always stress, you guys see all these people there. I never tell anyone, go follow me, watch my stuff, buy my $10 book. I don't do that. Right. What do I do? You need to start following this person, subscribe to their channel right? Go buy this guy's videos. Go buy this woman's videos. Subscribe to her stuff. Watch her train dogs. I tried to push people towards the best of the best. And for me, that mostly comes from the sport world. That's just me. That's, that's, those are the people that I, I really like to, to learn from. That's what's been most beneficial for me. And so that's where I steer people from. Not that there's not phenomenal pet dog trainers out there, right? But again, if a lot of these folks that struggle learn the complexities of dealing like with really high drive dogs and learn how to break things down like that, it helps. It makes the pet dog stuff much easier, even though 
dealing with pet dogs with problems is much harder, in my opinion, than training a nice, well-bred dog, right, to do cool things. Teaching things to a well-bred dog, much easier, I'm going to get hate for this, than dealing with super weak dogs with all kinds of problems. I'll never change my mind on that. You, you understand? It's just, that's, that's just a fact. It's very, very difficult. Take a weak dog, make it strong. That's awesome. If you can do that, then you're on to something. You understand? You understand what I'm saying? Do we have any questions, guys? Any questions at all? Oh, you'd be surprised. Road dogs rehab. A lot of people hate the truth. Listen, when I get off the live and 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 on Facebook, it says Larry Crone was live. That's when, oh, my God, it's getting there, Vincent. Like I'm, I'm, I'm moving around good. I actually just started walking today, like, you know, walking fat to try to start and it was okay. Pickleball geez, I tell you, um, what was I just saying? Yeah. What was I just saying? I, I went to answer Vincent. And I forgot. Now, if you guys have any questions, ask them now. I don't want to keep you on too long, you know? Yeah. I, I can't wait. Oh, there goes my coaster again. Damn it. I didn't spill this time, Steph. Hey, Steph, could you put that air down a little bit? It's a little warm in here. I don't know if you guys know, but I have a new assistant. My wife is my number one assistant now. Steph, would you like to come introduce yourself? She's not my assistant, she says. We're partners. Mm -hmm. You were saying when the post says, oh, yeah. Oh, thank you, Jane. When people see it says Larry Crone was live, that's when the hate think about that. The haters will come on and watch it so they they they're not seen coming on live. That's how fucked up. That's how fucked up this industry is. Like you have people that will hate you, but they can't stop watching you. They know everything you do. They could recite everything. You'll see them commenting to their other hater aid drinkers like the second you post something that that's a sickness man you know that's a real sickness and it shows how lonely you are and how little you have to live for and it's too bad it's too bad you know what i mean don't be hating just keep skating you know what i'm saying just do it um i i thought i saw a question what insurance do you have for your dogs? I don't have insurance for my dogs. I have business insurance through the Hartford. The business insured through the Hartford, but I don't have insurance for my dogs. You know, I've heard you talk about playing with your dog randomly while on walks without toys. Do you have any videos on this? I'm sure I do, Spencer, but um, I think what you're talking about um I talked about a while ago, breaking things in the different categories on walks, you know, like, like, like formal kind of structured walk, you know, adding little obedience, adding play, adding free time, you know, it makes it a lot more fun for the dog. Right. Oh, he, th this is a good topic too, guys. Okay. This has to be said. If you can't walk your dog properly, if you can't have an enjoyable walk with your dog, meaning if your dog blows up at dogs, people drags you down the street, right? Just It's just not enjoyable. Stop walking your dog. Stop walking your dog. An hour walk of misery compared to 10 minutes of good quality play and interaction in your own damn backyard with your dog, that 10 minutes of good quality interaction and play is going to far out benefit your struggling walk. And with your struggling walk, you're literally just teaching the dog to do what you don't want. Negative reinforcement's really powerful, guys. Really, really powerful. Such a powerful teacher, right? Negative reinforcement paired with positive reinforcement does amazing things. Now, unfortunately, to this day, a lot of people think negative reinforcement equates, you know, punishment or force or pain. It, it's so insane. But if you're, if I have a dog that I want to bite a bad guy in protection work or anything, 
or bark or get to that bad guy. What do we do? We're going to pull back. What does the average person do on walks? Their dog goes out ahead. The person pulls. The dog goes. Person pulls. Dog goes. And the dog gets right to where it wants to go. You're literally teaching the dog to do what you don't want it to do. If you want to teach your dog to walk nice, spend the time in front of your house and teach the dog how to walk. It takes 10 minutes. It takes 10 minutes, right? Get rid of the six-foot leash. Put them on a 26-foot flexi and go enjoy yourself. Let the dog be a dog and sniff and sniff. Call it back. Do a little walking. Do a little playing. little interaction, right? Start shaping the position you want, Okay. If your dog's behind you and it gets up and catches in front, what did we do with Dylan's dog? I think it was Dylan's dog, right? He was working on the formal heel, competition heel. We're having a hard time a little bit, but what happened when he just started walking? I made him hold the end of the long line, walked away from the dog. The dog got a nice position by itself. We started marking and rewarding. What happened? The head came right up, right? I think it was Dylan. You could shape these things you don't want the same way you could shape the things you don't want. Okay, think about that. What do you do when you don't want your dogs to do something in the house? Do you teach them how not to do something? No, you wait for them to do it. And then you explain to them that's the wrong answer. The same way when you're trying to shape something you do want, when they get close to even approximately what you want, you're marking and rewarding, right? It's the same thing. Like we covered so much stuff this weekend. I know a lot of people took notes and that's awesome because we touched on so many different things. That was what great about having so many different dogs and people there. The people that asked questions were fantastic. But again, 10 minutes of positive interaction with your dog through play is far superior than an hour of shitty walking. And you got all that extra time to do things then, right? Right? So what do we need if we're going to make things better? If you're dealing with problems, for one, inside the home, we got to identify the bad habits that got you to where you're at. Replace them with good habits, right? Make the rules and criteria inside your home much more clear to the dog. Be clear. Be very clear and consistent what is expected, right? And then build that dog up, build your relationship up through formal obedience and play. It's really easy, man. doesn't take a lot. I swear it doesn't take a lot. I promise you, all you guys can do it. You can all do it, right? You guys saw how all these dogs entered Saturday and what they were like by the end of the day. And then you saw what they were all like Sunday. Are they fixed? Absolutely not. But imagine now when you put them in a decent setting that's fair to them and you start implementing new ways, right? What's one of the things you hear me say most to people? We watch them hammering the dog. Dog blows up, bang, bang, bang. Dog blows up, bang, bang, bang. Okay, how long have you been doing that? Two years since the dog's been doing it. Okay, is it working? No, then why are you still doing it? If something's not working, guys, we have to change something, right? Have to change something. Change the picture for the dog. And very often, it may be as easy as taking a prong collar off the dog and putting something a little easier on the dog and getting better at communicating with the dog, right? These dogs, especially a lot of these strong dogs, they get so immune to the prong collars and the e-collars, it's useless. There's no more effect, okay? No more effect on the dog. Ah, oh, my coaster again. All right, let's take some questions and I'll let you guys go. You got it, Jess. Uh, I have been trying, but my guy is tough, but not giving. I will see you in Toronto with him in September. Uh... Yeah, Brad, you don't want me to repeat some of our conversations, Brad, all the things your dog couldn't do that you swore. You've killed it, buddy. I use you in, as, as an example all the time. Yeah, <laughs> maybe, Jessica. I'm not a good coaster user. I don't use them. 
Oh, I don't think it's letting me go up here for some reason. Uh oh. Oh, it's not letting me go up to look at the questions. There we go. Oh. Long answer, but you have already showed the negative consequence. So now how hey, you train a positive guy. Uh long road dogs rehab. Let me see what you're asking here. Long answer, but you have already showed the negative consequences. So now you train the positive and guide the, you might, I guess he's maybe answering someone else. You lost me there. That's why I'm trying to keep up. Uh, what's, what's Trish say? No question. I just want to say thank you for your videos and rants. I appreciate and learn something from everyone as I raise a puppy. Thank you, Trish. Appreciate that. Uh, Oh, man, my little arrow thing isn't working, and it's not letting me freaking go up to see questions. Uh-oh. Let me see if I do this. Oh, maybe because I was hitting the wrong one. <laughs> All right, I'm going to look if you guys have any questions. If not, I'll just get going. Um, for clear communication, do you recommend using a clicker? You can use a clicker. You can use whatever you like. I like verbal commands because it's always with me, verbal markers. I, I like clickers with puppies. Um, I've liked using clickers in the past, like uh, teaching my higher drive dogs, like more complicated tricks, because my reward marker, yes, elicits a lot of excitement and energy from my dogs. That's what I want. So if I'm teaching something like a reverse handstand or something, I don't want that high energy. I want the dog calmer. So I would use clickers in that in that sense. I like what it does there. Okay, now it's moving. How long does it take to cultivate a goatee like that? <laughs> Many, you know, if I shave this all off tomorrow, Tony, in two days, I'd look just like this again. Hey, listen, I don't for, I don't remember the guy's name, but there's some trainer on YouTube that's been posting a lot of videos, and he's a hater. He goes after a lot of trainers and says a lot of hateful things. So the other day, my wife was a video watched up, and I saw her watch it. She don't watch dog videos. And I said, what do you watch? And she goes, he's talking about you and Robert Cabral. I said, don't watch that. Like, you're going to get so upset you start watching people. But then I watched it. I knew who he was, and I started watching it. And he really didn't say nothing bad about me, you know, but I have to give him credit. He was mocking me and referred to me as the Sopranos meet Duck Dynasty. <laughs> How can I get mad at that? The dude is dead on, man. Like, that was absolutely brilliant. I can't hate that. I cannot hate that, man. That was pretty good. Need a good remote collar. What brand is good for a Rottweiler? Well, the breed has nothing to do with it, Oscar. Um, I use e-collar technologies mini educator for every dog, right? That's just my go-to for most people. Um Martin System Chameleon is an outstanding piece of equipment. It's a lot more expensive and complicated, but it's a really, really nice piece of equipment. So those are the two that I would normally look at. Dogtra makes good products. I'm not crazy about their customer service, you know, as long as it's one of the main brands. But that's I use the e-collar tech mini educator for almost every dog. And the Martin System is an outstanding piece of equipment. It's just a little more complicated and expensive. Aaron, Cairo and I have played every day. Here, let me pull this up. Cairo and I have played every day since the summer and just focus on building our, it's been a life changing for both of us. Thank you for that. That's awesome, Aaron. I love hearing it. You're, you're a really outstanding sport, man. I tell you, I really enjoyed you. I had a good time with you, you know, because that's not easy to do that stuff. Why is this shit not, man? <sighs> Do you think Luca could get off the prong and maybe change to a dominant slip collar? Um, absolutely, Ashley. Um, I don't like the prong collars on dogs like that. They get fired up, right? I usually take them off right away. I would prefer Luca on like uh, one of Joel Silverman's collars. I gave someone there. I, I use them on my dogs. If, if you go to Joel Silverman's website and look at the collars he makes, the alternative collar, I think he calls it, because Joel lives a very alternative lifestyle. Like, I like those collars. They're very simple, very basic. But um, that's my go-to. Like, I keep a bunch of them. He's always giving me different sizes, and they're very convenient, very easy. 
those prong collars can get a lot of those dogs fired up big time, you know, like big time for sure. Uh, but yeah, you guys are pretty amazing. And we'll talk this week for sure. Hey, I'm in Louisiana and to be compared to Ducks Dynasty is a compliment right here. Yeah. Hey, listen, Sopranos meets Ducks Dynasty. That's me. Absolutely. Donna, getting a new Malpup Saturday. Looking forward to including more play into my training than I have with my other dog. Oh, you got a clean slate, Donna. It's, uh, it's awesome. Take that dog every place. Every place and just play with them. That's, that's all you got to do. Don't worry about anything else. Take that dog every place and play with them. You know? Uh, David, hey, Larry, thanks for your phone call the other day. One question I had from it was how undisturbed should the grass be when starting tracking? Um, where'd that go? Is it fine if it has been walked on before? Now you cut, you, you know, you want to start off with something a little more fresh, like first thing in the morning, David, you know, before people start trampling all over it, you know, it's going to be a little easier for you, but we could talk about that. Um, what's the number one thing you suggest to help with a pity that has bitten asking for a client? There, there is, you can't answer that. Um, where'd that go? Where'd that go? Is that James? I lost the comment there. There, there is no answer to that. If that was James. Okay. You just, you can't answer that. Like there's so much more you need to know. And there's so much more to it. Like there's, there's a lot more to dog training. You know what I mean? A lot more, a lot more. Let me see. Jamie, here we go here. Okay. Is it Jamie Sue? What's the number one thing you should just to help with a pity that bit has bitten asking for it. you. You can't like there. You need so much more information than that. You know, you need a lot more information. Uh, when she plays, she loves to bite. Should I worry? Girl loves tug, but also bites me. Well, you got to fix that. Like they're, when they break the rules like that, that's a perfect opportunity to teach no. Okay. Like remember a big, a big part of, of playing and interacting like that is you're, you're teaching rules and boundaries. You get to really make your communication very clear. Right. But that's a perfect opportunity. That's a violation. You can't do that. You know, perfect opportunity. Ooh. Yeah, Brad, they're 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 great collars. I like them. I like them very much. I'm sorry, guys. I'm just looking for questions, and it's hard to keep up here because I don't know what's going on. We're getting hacked. Let's see, Andrea. I have a very strong dominant dog that was trained way too hot and protection and was getting aggressive. I found your videos and it said to stop protection for the last two years. He has become another dog through play going to start protection again with Marco this summer. Cool. Good deal. Happens a lot, Andrea. Like people, we talked a lot about that this weekend. People get a dog that's genetically capable of biting and they get a little high on that idea and it's an adrenaline rush and they think they're teaching the dog something when in reality it's there, they're not teaching anything and they ignore everything else that, that should be, uh, that should be worked on. Right. Mm. Uh, I've been hearing the halo collar has a bunch of glitch. I know nothing about the halo collars. So I can't really answer that. Would you be willing to share pictures of your garage kennel area where you keep dogs? We're hoping going to start house. Yeah, it's, it's real simple, Kaylee. Like I have a really, it, it's like 25 by 65, almost 70 feet long. And they're mostly on one side. And I, I use those, um, oh, what are they called? My God, something dogs. Four by four by six kennels with the cover on them, pointed kennel. Oh my God. Lucky dog, lucky dog kennels. I used to get them for like 300 bucks a piece. They were super cheap. So they've gone up in price from what I understand a lot. And I have, you know, it's heat heated and air conditioning in there, but I'll show you, I'll show you something. It's a, it's a simple setup, right? Very simple, but I can show you. Absolutely. Do you go live often? I used to, Karina, but I kind of stopped. I haven't done it much, but I'll probably start up a little bit now. 
Um, do you think Joel's collar for a Frenchie would be okay? I've heard you should only use harness because they're prone to breathing problems. What's your thoughts? Well, I don't, I'm not big on harnesses unless they're for a reason, but again, it has more to do with training. And if your dog's going to pull you down the street, then most collars are going to choke a Frenchie. But again, that comes back to training, right? Uh, Larry, I got the e-collar with the chameleon add-on works great. I feel like I can't lower the power significantly due to the extra context. What do you think of the new halo? No, nothing about the halo guys. Uh, what do you recommend reading or watching before your seminar to prime the brain? Porn always works great, Spencer, but I don't know if you could read porn anymore. I'm just kidding. Totally kidding. Don't have to read anything. Don't have to read anything. If you could understand and figure out the difference between negative reinforcement and positive punishment, but good luck finding stuff on that, right? Ooh, ah, let's see. I'm looking. I'm just looking for questions. I think my question is getting lost. What what was it, Jamie? Oh, you're very welcome, Gina. Can you elaborate on picking up toys in the house as recommended? Here's the thing, Jessica. If you don't have problems with your dogs, I don't care what people do, right? Do do whatever you want. The problem is you'll have people say things like the, you'll have a dog with shitload of behavioral problems, right? Like this is what I deal with every day. And then they say, my dog has no interest in me. My dog won't play. It won't play fetch. It won't play tug. They won't do anything. You know, my dog chews everything up. You, you name it. And then you go in the house and there's toys all over. Okay. Here's, here's the example I always use. And hopefully my wife doesn't hear me. My wife's a very beautiful woman. I'm still very attracted to her, right? We've been together 34 years. I'm still very attracted to her. But if every day I came home, she was standing in the doorway naked, it's going to be exciting at first, but then eventually I'm going to be like, holy shit, again, it's not going to be that interesting anymore. You understand? So if you have a dog that you'd really like to be interested in games and playing, and it's not, but yet it has access to everything all the time, it just becomes less important, right? Um, I have a basket of toys in my living room and when Mango comes in, she goes in there and she takes out every toy and they're all over the floor, but I don't have any issues with her and she's still toy motivated and loves to play. You understand? So I don't care. It's like, it's not like I don't have toys in my house, you know, but now if like all my dogs were taking out toys and fighting over toys and it was chaos, then I wouldn't be doing that. Do you get involved when one dog in the house just gets pissed and goes off on your other, not over bones or anything, but maybe gets hurt by accident or no? I, my dogs don't, Kelly, um, ever, but I wouldn't allow that. You know, like if, if I see a dog being a pain in the ass, I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to take care of that. All right, Jamie, let's see what you got here. Um, I have two female Rottweilers in the home. I've been a couple of fights. They are living separated in kennels in the same room. After connecting with you and obtaining that advice, the younger pup who was the one initially attacked is really reactive when she's the one in the kennel. And the older one is out of the kennel walking by or playing or training with me, etc. You had told me to use lemon juice in a squirt bottle on the younger pup, but she's loving that. Is there all right? That's funny. Well, here's the thing: you have to do something you know, like to deal with the dog in in the crate, right? You just have to. So whatever works there, I, I I don't know. Come up with it, right? Like the spray bottle just tends to work because you can't get to the dog. But again, there's a lot more to that whole situation you have. You know, without me seeing the whole picture, how you're dealing with things, how you're dealing with with each dog, that's that's kind of tough to to answer okay but you have to be able to stop that behavior in the crate all right now i don't like i don't like vinegar and stuff like that is like it tends to just burn dog and stuff you know but look at 
the reason a lot of people turn to spray bottles and stuff is you have a lot of dogs that have been completely like just obliterated, obliterated by prong collars and e-collars and nothing works. So just doing something novel, you know, a, a can of air spray, you know, you know, the, the condensed air, like I forget what they call them. Anything that's different often will have a, a good effect on interrupting behaviors because it's new and it's novel. You understand? But as people could tell you that we're at the seminar this weekend, one of the biggest issues we deal with are many people are completely ineffective with their dog, no matter what they do, just completely ineffective. And I don't mean in a, in a sense, yeah, pet, pet corrector. Thank you, Vincent. The air compressed thing is pet corrector. And I don't mean like from like a punishment or physical standpoint, they're completely ineffective. Like they can't, like a lot of people can't allow their, well, can't even stop their dog and allow them to be still, right? The dog just pulls and is anxious and people can't get their dog to be still. That's a problem, right? If we can't get our dog to be still, how are we supposed to stop our dog from going after other dogs? You understand? So like we fail at the most basic, simple things. So you're, you're talking about dealing with two dogs fighting, right? But what is the rest of your interaction and capabilities of with those dogs? Do you understand? Do you have full control? Is your communication really clear? Like, why is it that when you tell the dog, knock that shit off, they say, screw you, right? We have to really look deep into that. You understand? Like, it's really important. Like, everybody just wants the answer to, um, to hey, how do I stop this? Well, you got to train your dog, first of all, right? Like you have to train your dog. So can you stand there and tell your dog, hey, sit down, stand, heel, and will your dog just move from position to position without you moving and helping? Like very few people can do that, right? But then when your dog is insane in like full kill mode and fighting other dogs, you don't understand why you can't say, hey, stop that. So you have to focus on the really simple, basic things, right? Again, the basic foundation, like, do you have a strong foundation with your dog? Can you tell your dog to do this? Can you tell your dog that wants that? Hey, you can't have that. I need you to do this. You understand? Like, it's really important. It's really, really important. And the truth is most people, because most dog trainers, can't fix two dogs fighting in the same home. It's the truth. Most dog trainers are not going to fix that. The chance of a, a regular dog owner fixing that without some kind of help is slim to none, especially with two Rottweilers, two pit bulls, two power breeds, slim to none. Then you live a life of separation. And what happens is when people keep two dogs in that situation and you continue to live a life of separation, Neither dog ever gets to live a fulfilled life because you're just keeping them safe. And the problem is two management fails 100% of the time, right? So there's always two options. And everyone I talk to whose dogs are fighting this time, you have two options. You either fix it. That means you have to find the right person and you have to do whatever it takes to fix it. Or you find a good home for one of them and allow both of them to have their best life possible. Can it be fixed? Absolutely. I work with people all the time that do amazing things and fix that 100% of the time. But not everyone has the same capabilities. Okay? There are people that you could work with till you're blue in the face. They're never going to be a good dog handler. It doesn't come natural to them. You could send me to mechanic school or construction worker school or carpenter school, I am never going to be handy. I'm never going to be able to fix anything. I don't have those genes, right? My brother does. My brother can fix anything, put things together. I will wait for him to come down here once a year to fix things and put things together. I don't have that capability. There's a lot of people like that, a lot of dog owners who will never ever be able to handle their dogs. They just don't have the capability. And it's not... And I'm not saying that's you, Jamie, because I haven't really seen you handle the dogs in person, right? But that's just the God's honest truth. And then they get 
way too much dog for them. Way too much dog. And then they get more dogs. And one dog was too much, but now they have two dogs and three dogs. I've talked to people with up to 19 dogs. Dogs fighting in the house. How many dogs do you have? 19. That's a problem. That's a big problem. You understand? Been working with local trainers and have talked with you once, hoping to get more help from you. Uh, well, what's your local trainers doing? You understand? Because we all know how that goes. And I'm not trying to be like, like crap. I don't know who your trainers are. You might have great trainers. Um, but the truth is most, you know what most people do, Jamie? Ah, we'll do board and train. Send your dogs here for a board and train. That's not going to fix it. It's not going to fix it. It has to come from within. Like it has to come from you. Someone guiding you through it, you know, has to come from you guiding you and teaching you with it. And I know because I've done it over and over and over. And it's successful because it's only maybe at most 10% me, 90% owner. Then we have plenty of people out there that I've shown not only shown the dogs no longer fighting, I've shown the dogs seven, eight years later not fighting. Again, that wasn't because of me. That's because I gave the people the information and helped them, guide them, taught them how to do the things they needed to do. And they did it. They're just all amazing that have done it. You understand? But there is no simple answer. It takes work and it takes time. You know, uh, yes, they aren't equipped enough to handle it. They gave me some good starters, but yeah, it made me do a board and train. Of course, that's where the money is. How is a board and train supposed to help you? Like, ask them that. How will this help me? Right? Would you pay two grand, three grand, four grand? How is it supposed to help you? It's not going to help you. They're going to put those dogs back in the house and they're going to go right back to killing each other. Guarantee it. Guarantee it. If they don't, I'll pay your bills. Okay. <laughs> because that's how sure I am. You know, I've made big changes. I wish I had found you first. Hey, Larry, I'm struggling with versus and the out in the suit. I'm going to drive down one of these days and parking. <laughs> Can't wait to see you again, buddy. Hopefully they don't lock me up in Canada this time. You know, for sure. Yeah, it's a lot, man. Two Rottweilers fighting. Woo! It's a lot. What's this say? Brianna Day. Hey, Larry, I was happy to quickly meet you in Clarksville some weeks ago at the Off Leash Can. We've always really appreciated your approach to dog training and hope to get some of your seminars. And my question is, what's your thoughts on training dogs that are considered stubborn or motivated? Do I need to focus more time on building the relationship in the initial phases of training? Will this directly affect how motivated the dog is to work for me? Yeah, Brianna, like, like you know what? Unmotivated, yes. Stubborn, you know, different dogs are, you know, some dogs are more difficult than others, right? If you're working a bloodhound as opposed to a Malinois, yeah, very different. They're going to be, your, be very stubborn, but you got to remember they're very different dogs, right? So expectations have to change and we can't decide what a dog finds motivating, right? Only the dog can decide that. And so, I, I could only speak for myself. I'm always going to try to find what that dog finds motivating. And sometimes that's almost impossible. Sometimes they never have any desire for food or play or toys, right? Sometimes the thing that motivates them the most is just going out to sniff and pee and poop. So I will incorporate that. Sometimes it's playing with another dog. If I have to, I will incorporate that. Right. Let's say I have a this is real common. I'll get a lot of German short hair pointers and some of the pointers I get. They have no interest in food. They have no interest in playing with me, no interest in, in games. None of that. They're just obsessed with pointing at birds and looking for birds and watching rabbit like obsessed. Right. But if we're going to train, then 
the dog has to understand, okay, I need you to do this first with me, but then I'm going to give you what you want, right? And that becomes the reward. Go find birds. Put the dog on a long line. Okay, we're going to do a little work. You're free. Go do what you want, right? And I'm going to be there as part of that with them to assist them. And then maybe now I start introducing and practicing recalls. You know, let's go. They come back to me. Good job. Boom. Release to the to the game. To them, the game is finding birds, you know, sniffing rabbits, sniffing the ground, being allowing them to do what they're bred to do. You understand? Like that's really, really important, like really important. And some dogs, like people will say, has no desire to play, right? Well, it could take a couple of weeks of trying once or twice a day and spending 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, just trying to find that dog something that ticks. It's not easy. It's not easy, you know? Sometimes we will just get dogs to play with food and chase food and we make games out of that. A lot of dogs like have no interest in food, no interest in chasing food, no interest in chasing a ball or playing tug, but they love personal play. Uh, Kate's dog, uh, Loki, the Doberman that I use for our project. He won't chase a ball. He'll play a little tug, but he's not real committed. But boy, once I smacked him in the ass and put him in a headlock, it was on. It was on, right? That was our game. Like he absolutely just lit up. That's what he finds rewarding. Am I going to change that because I want him to chase a ball? Absolutely not. I'm going to give him what he finds rewarding, you know? Hope that makes sense. All right. Let's see. I think I'm going to let you guys go. Um uh, yeah. All right, guys. Well, look, um, uh, what's all right. One more question. One more question. Where'd it go? Jason in Australia. Cause I love my Australians. Hi from Australia. Currently have a small male cavoodle, AKA cavapoo, <laughs> like poo. And we'll be getting a female working German Shepherd dog puppy in a few weeks. Any tips on having a successful introduction into the family dynamic? Puppy will be created in playpen when unsupervised. Currently, dog doesn't hesitate to correct an unruly dog. Yeah, for me, Jason, I don't allow my new puppies to be a pain in the ass to my dogs. It's it's really simple. I can I use a lot of management with puppies. You know, I never want my dogs to think that they're tortured by this puppy and they have to deal with that. Like I don't allow it. Right. I normally don't allow the interaction like fully until I know I can control it or the puppy's not out of control, but that's just me. Like for an instance, when we got Benny, my, my the, our Chihuahua, he's one pound, like as small as you can imagine. Right. So he's going to be introduced to my dogs, but I went slow and I went one dog at a time and he was in an X pen and like, let's say Mango was on a leash on the other side of the X-Pen and they're allowed to check each other out. And then once Mango, my Malinois, was good on the leash, then I had her off the leash on the outside of the X-Pen. Once I knew they were good like that, then I eventually took them out and the Chihuahua was loose and Mango was on a leash, on a long line. And once I knew she was safe around the puppy, not because she would attack her, I wanted to make sure she was careful enough not to hurt her, to step on Benny, the, the, the Chihuahua. Once I knew Mango was safe enough where she wasn't going to slant, you know, stomp on the Chihuahua, then they were off together. So I went really slow and took my time. You won't deal with that because you're not dealing with super tiny dogs, right? But I'm just not going to let my puppy be a pain in the ass. All right. All right, guys. I appreciate y'all. Uh, again, thank you to everyone in Arkansas for making it an absolutely insane, like just a, a very memorable weekend for me. Like truly appreciate it. And I'm sure I'll see you guys next year around the same time. Um, I want Rob to get Heinz ketchup by then. I'm going to talk to him about that and everything else will be real good. Okay, but have a good night, guys. And again, as always, thank you very much for your support. Now I'm signing out. So haters, come on and watch this and then call each other and talk about how you can't stand me. I'm so just such an asshole, an arrogant prick with my fat face. You fucking losers. Get on getting off now. You guys can get on. Okay, you fat fucks. All right, guys. Peace. Sorry for the bad words. You know who you are.